All right, good morning. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. I'm Lisa Chamberlain and uh, we'll be playing the role of Mary this morning. Uh, we are very excited today uh, to welcome Dr. Tumani Coker, who will be giving our Richard E. Behrman Endowed Lecture. Uh, more on that in a minute. Um, as routine, please text the code that you see there uh, to claim your CME credit. A few announcements before we get started this morning. So some upcoming sessions in March to honor Women's History Month. Uh, next week, we're going to hear from Dr. Elena Fuentes Affleck, uh, who will be coming down from UCSF to talk to us about how to think about health disparities in uh, careers in pediatrics, followed by uh, Dr. Kay Kayla Lopez, who's coming to us from Baylor, and uh, our own Cara Davis will be giving the Cone Lecture to round out the month. On Monday, March 7th, uh, we would love to see you join us for the Biodesign, uh, Designing Innovations to Improve Health. Um, so please do register for that, one of uh, the many MCHRI seminars coming up. And registration is now open for the MCC POP 41st Annual Perinatal Potpourri Advances in Care. The QR code is there uh, so that you can register for that easily. That looks very exciting at the end of the month. And on March 24th, the Center for Definitive and Curative Medicine will be holding its sixth annual symposium. Uh, so please do register uh, for that to confirm attendance. And our sixth annual Frontiers in Diabetes Research Symposium will be held April 12th uh, from nine to four here uh, in person, Burke Hall. So very exciting, uh, lots of exciting work happening there. Uh, again, do register. There'll be a poster session in the morning and many exciting featured speakers. And finally, don't forget to have on your calendar our 13th annual pediatrics research retreat. Uh, we'll have a wonderful keynote, lots of great speakers, poster sessions, uh, get to learn from each other what, how everything is going with folks for search and uh, very happily we're all going to be back together in person. So please do make sure that that is on your calendar. So that covers all of our announcements. I'd um, like to hand it over now to Dr. Paul Wise, who holds the Behrman Professor Chair of Child Health and Society uh, to introduce our speaker. Paul? Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, the Richard E. Dick Behrman MD Endowed Lectureship in Pediatrics was established to honor Dick's service and leadership at Packard and on behalf of children's health worldwide. Uh, Dick passed away in 2020, but many listening today remember well his many contributions to our institution, chairing both the boards of Packard Children's Hospital and the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. Dick was both a physician and a lawyer and was always committed to health equity, human rights, and to intense cross-disciplinary collaboration commitments that lay at the core of his many important contributions to pediatrics and his devotion to training. Training what came to be several generations of pediatricians and others devoted to health and well-being of children in the United States and around the world. I know he would be delighted to know that Dr. Tumani Coker is the Behrman lecturer this year. Tamani is Chief of the Division of General Pediatrics and Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine and Seattle Children's Hospital. She founded and directed the Seattle Children's Center for Diversity and Health Equity and currently serves as the co-director of the University of Washington's NIH-funded Child Health Equity Research Fellowship. Tumani did her undergraduate work in psychology at Stanford, welcome home Tumani, and earned an MBA and medical degree at UCLA. She did her residency in pediatrics at Cedar sinai Medical Center and an RWJ Clinical Scholars Fellowship at the University of Chicago. Tumani's intellect, commitment, and leadership have led to a variety of major national positions including her appointment to the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and serving as chair of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicines Committee on addressing the long-term impact 
of the COVID-19 pandemic on children and families. Uh, simply put, Tumani has emerged as one of the country's, country's leading voices in pediatrics, particularly in the redesign of pediatric primary care, a redesign that speaks directly to questions of justice, redesign that will better ensure health equity and the elimination of social disparities in child health outcomes. She conducts highly creative community-based research and significantly is devoted to the translation of this research into innovative yet intensely pragmatic primary care services that directly address community needs and strengths. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tumani Coker as this year's Richard Behrman Lecturer. Thanks, Tumani. Thank you so much, Paul, uh, for that introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be here in person. Um, even though you may not be able to tell I am in person, I am here on Stanford's campus. Uh, and it's a great honor for me to be the uh, Richard E. Behrman, um, uh, be giving the Richard E. Berman uh, endowed lectureship um, today. So I um, am quite honored to be able to do that. So uh, let's get started. I want to spend uh, the morning really talking about um, how to integrate community health workers uh, into team-based early childhood preventive care. Uh, and I don't have any uh, relevant financial relationships or conflicts of interest to disclose. So I, I wanna start with um, a quick story. And the picture you see here on your screen is, is not the family I'm talking about, but it's uh, nicely illust um, illustrative of what I'll be talking about. So uh, as a general pediatrician and a health services researcher, um, in my research, I partner with community clinics. And so one of those community clinics is in Tacoma, Washington. It's a federally qualified health center. And so uh, one, one day a, a mom came into um, the clinic for her two week a uh, newborn visit with her baby. The uh, clinic team identified a number of social um, needs that the um, parent had, uh, scheduled a follow-up visit for a month, and then her well child care visit at two months. Uh, and then the first visit was missed. Um, she didn't come to the clinic. They tried calling her at the phone numbers that they had, and they were disconnected. Um, she didn't come for the two month visit and the clinic had assumed they just lost contact with the parent and, and weren't able to uh, get her any of the contact information they had. And then right around the four months of life for this infant, the mom shows up at the clinic uh, without an appointment and comes straight to the front desk and says, can I see Rosa, please? And so I didn't tell you who Rosa is, but Rosa is a uh, bicultural, bilingual coach, a health coach that the clinic has as part of a, a grant fund funded project that we did together. And Rosa has been um, integrated into their well child care team. And so of course saw this parent when they came for their two week visit, made that connection with her. So Rosa comes out, sees the mom, um, finds out that her phone, of course, has been disconnected, which is why they couldn't contact her and she wasn't able to purchase another phone. Uh, her and the baby had been living um, with different friends, um, um, sleeping on people's couches from here to there, uh, and was able to immediately um, work with the mom, connect her for emergency housing, uh, be able to connect her with other social services and really got her back connected with the clinic um, to get um, help her get really things on, on track and make that connection again. And so what I, I love about that story is that it reminds us that for many families, uh, having that single primary care provider is important, but it's not enough. And families will make connections with other members of our team if we allow that to happen and we make it available. Uh, and so when this mother wasn't had a specific need, uh, the person that she chose to ask for when she came to the clinic that day was Rosa. 
So I want to start here with the, um, this is the report that came out uh, from the National Academies on implementing high quality primary care. And um, so this was a report of the, of the Academy's uh, committee on implementing high quality primary care, uh, which I was a part of, came out in last year in 2021 and really talks about how can we implement high quality uh, primary care in the country. And as part of the report, we defined um, what is high quality primary care. And so it's the provision of whole person integrated, accessible and equitable healthcare by interprofessional teams that are accountable for addressing the majority of an individual's health and wellness needs across settings and through sustained relationships with patients, families, and communities. And so I want to key in on this interprofessional care teams that are accountable for addressing the majority of an individual's health. And that's in relationship with patients, families, and communities. And that's not quite typical of the way that we provide primary care in this country uh, across settings, um, but it's, um, it's key. And so in that report, the, um, the report made several key recommendations for how we can implement high quality primary care. And one of those was that payers should pay for interprofessional integrated team-based care to allow this kind of care to uh, be provided to our communities. So team-based care is really uh, including um, non-clinicians into the general um, primary care team, really integrating them so that they're a part of it. Some of the benefits of team-based care are that first, it enhances the care that we can provide um, in terms of uh, social determinants of health. Uh, it is essential for providing integrated care of any type. Uh, it's most, most apparent in um, behavioral health uh, and primary care integration, that to be able to do that type of integrated care, you need to have other members of your team that are linking um, those provider teams together. But it's important for social, integrating social uh, health, oral population health, all those things into primary care. And then it promotes health equity. And I would say it's essential for promoting health equity. Um, if the concept around health equity is that when we see a family for a primary care visit, uh, perhaps one family is okay with our 20 minute well child care visit with the primary care um, a provider. But another family may need many other services around social health or care coordination that one provider is not going to be able to do in that one visit. And so we have to have the team available to provide those services. Now on the left of the screen here, this is also from the, um, the uh, National Academy's report on implementing high quality care. And it's just this picture of really how um, expansive and broad the team can be. Um, and a big part of that is who is on the team uh, is dependent on the needs of the community and the resources available in that community. Uh, the resources uh, available for the clinic and practice, the partnerships that they have. And then um, finally, the developmental stage of the patient and the, and the family. So you can see here, the patient and family is in the center of the team. Uh, and for early childhood, for example, there may be an early childhood specialist, uh, at times, the school-based support as a child gets to school, behavioral health specialists, community health workers. So there's a broad range of people on the team, and that team has to shift as the needs of the community and the needs of the family uh, and the resources shift as well. So uh, I'm going to, of course, focus on how we integrate community health workers into primary care. And, I'm going to talk about community health workers as a large um, umbrella term, it really covers um, generally folks in the uh, role of health educators, health navigators, uh, focused really from early childhood birth to three services. We have great evidence on in, uh, incorporating those individuals into uh, primary care. There are plenty of examples and um, evidence on integrating uh, community health workers into 
uh, primary care specifically for behavioral health concerns, chronic disease management, in particular asthma, and then social and medical complexity for patients and families. So these are generally community members who are trusted by families and share lived experiences with the families that we care for. They're able to link established resources in the community and those services to what families need in the, um, in the clinic and in the, in the practice. They can provide enhanced communication and coordination with broader teams that extend outside of the uh, medical home uh, into, the, into the community. And they can also be uh, utilized to really provide a standardized screening and referral services um, for items found with those standardized screening items. And I'll get into more of that as we hone in on the preventive care for zero to three. So I think while we can make a case uh, for, of course, uh, integrating community health workers into team-based care across primary care, um, uh, really across the uh, age continuum, for me, it's, it's most uh, special for uh, that early childhood stage. And one of the reasons is that we ask so much of parents in a very stressful time of their lives. So we ask people to come in for 10 preventive care visits in the ages of zero to three. Uh, and when they're coming in, our, our structure is it's a 20 minute visit at, you know, generally at most uh, with the pediatrician or a, another uh, pediatric provider. And so if we're not utilizing that time to meet the needs of families, um, then in essence, we are, are, are wasting precious time uh, that they have. Um, and to be able to really provide that care, we need a team. So I, I will just quickly go through this. I don't have to remind you of the, uh, really how expansive that our, our guidelines are in terms of bright futures and providing uh, well child care and what needs to go into a visit. Um, but it's well defined in our um, the AAP guidelines and of course includes the history and measurements, uh, physical examination and various procedures um, during uh, early childhood and beyond. Developmental and behavioral screening, surveillance, and guidance really to identify, um, first identify risk with a structured screening, and then in between those structured screening um, visits to for developmental, social, including social emotional uh, surveillance, um, but also to help families identify uh, ways that they can and practice ways that they can promote healthy development. Uh, uh, and, and get their child to their um, greatest potential in terms of development. Anticipatory guidance, of course, is that one uh, guidance that we're providing to families on things that they have concerns about already or have questions about and things that they really haven't um, started to think about that are looking ahead. So safety, um, car seat safety and um, food introduction, uh, book sharing as we see here with this family. And then psychosocial and social needs screening and guidance. Uh, and this was really bolstered in the fourth edition of Bright Futures. Uh, and it was great to see that I um, got to be a part of the um, expert panel for this last um, fourth edition and really expand what we should be doing in terms of social needs um, screening and community resource uh, referral for families. Um, looking for things that that family came to Rosa for in terms of um, risk of homelessness, uh, housing insecurity, food insecurity, intimate partner violence, um, substance use, uh, neighborhood safety. So a range of, of issues. So I use Donna Bedian's uh, quality framework, and in particular, the framework uh, that was expanded by Barbara Starfield and as really the way to kind of set how I think about uh, how we should be structuring um, the, the team and the structure of how we provide uh, early childhood preventive care. And so it's helpful because it 
links the structure of our care to the processes of our care to the outcomes. And so the outcomes, of course, are the clinical outcomes that we care so much about, the um, patient experiences of care, and then the population level um, outcomes. The processes um, lead to the outcomes, and the processes are what we do for the patient, um, the care that we provide, both the, the provision of care and then that receipt of care. And then the structure determines the processes that we can do. So it's a personnel, the facilities, the way that those facilities um, and personnel are organized to work together, the information systems that hold them together and the financing. And so last year I, I worked with um, one of our uh, junior faculty members uh, at Seattle Children's, Kendra Lienquist, uh, who's focused on culturally uh, relevant developmental screening um, for uh, birth to three. And we took that framework and thought, well, what does it look like for birth to three preventive care if we're focused on families who are living in the intersection of racism and poverty? Because they are coming to their visits with multiple needs that aren't really uh, integrated or are created in that structure that we have right now. So the outcomes are not surprising, right? It's really how do we increase health and well-being for children and families across developmental domains, um, social needs. So how do we create better outcomes? The processes of care, I would argue, are pretty well defined. Uh, not that we can do them all in a, in a visit, but they are well defined within our Bright Futures guidelines. Uh, they include really relational health, um, ensuring that parents have that social support that they need, early learning promotion. So we have a very good understanding of what the provision of care is. And then for the receipt of care, that's also fairly well defined because we have um, the the real tenets of the uh, patient-centered medical home that define receipt of care as accessible, continuous, comprehensive, coordinated, compassionate, compassionate and culturally effective. But then it's that structure that supports the process that we kind of are faltering on. So to have this level of a process for a visit, we have to have a structure that can support it. And that structure would be team-based care because one person is not going to be able to provide all these services in one visit, regardless of how long that visit is, um, particularly for families uh, that are living in the intersection of racism and poverty. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. The facilities need to include um, connection and coordination with our community resources that families are going to need. Um, for it to meet, to meet their, their own needs. Um, places like early learning centers, all really connected and working with the clinics and the families. Uh, and so what we end up with is that we have a process for early childhood preventive care without the structure uh, to support it. And so that's where these team bases approaches to care really come in, um, in terms of uh, team-based team -based approaches to care that emphasize relationships that are ongoing and continuous uh, and integrated within uh, our primary care system. And so what is interesting is that we have a lot of data that team-based approaches to care work, not only in uh, pediatric primary care, but in primary care in general. And specifically for zero to three, there's uh, many uh, areas where, that have um, looked at and, and reported in the literature uh, effectiveness in terms of um, showing that these team based approaches, team based approaches to care, uh, are effective for increasing the services that families receive in a well child care visit, um, expanding uh, the services that they do receive in terms of social needs uh, and referrals, developmental services. Uh, being more up to date on world child care visits, uh, up to date on immunizations, changing parent behaviors uh, in terms of more positive parent parenting techniques, uh, and reducing emergency department uh, visits in between those world child care visits. So there's a, the evidence exists for these. 
Dulce is a program that uses a family specialist who becomes part of the primary care team to see um, all families um, from the uh, newborns uh, on in that um, first several months of life. Healthy Steps is a, a national a program that you may be aware of. It incorporates a Healthy Steps specialist in a tiered model of care where the Healthy Steps specialist uh, sees patients uh, based on uh, family need identified by the provider in that zero to three area. And then I'm going to talk about a community uh, engaged uh, design and, and implementation of uh, using a parent coach and uh, an intervention that we've been working on for uh, years now called Parent Focus Redesign for Encounters Newborns to Toddlers. And it incorporates a parent coach into all well child care visits um, from zero to three. And, and there are others uh, as well um, that they may have time to just cover a couple other approaches to how to do this kind of team-based care and integrate community health workers into primary care towards the end. Um, but I want to focus in on an example for a few minutes of what this looks like on the ground uh, in one example. So I started this work um, in Los Angeles when I was a faculty at UCLA and really working with three uh, community clinics. One was an FQHC, two were community practices that served 95% plus Medicaid uh, insured kids. And the providers and the administration and kind of leadership of those clinics recognized we are seeing families who um, are dealing with um, multiple social needs, living in poverty, and have uh, faced the, the historical marginalization um, that comes with being of color in this country. And so they're coming to their visits with a lot more needs than can be um, addressed really in our current structure of care. And I think as providers, they recognized that and said, you know, we don't want to be, we want a different way to be able to provide care, knowing that working in this current structure is not working for us and it's not working for the families. And it never feels good to have a family leave knowing that you weren't able to address really what, the, what needs that they had. So we started with these practices um, in terms of really starting from the beginning on what do families need? So we started as, as any kind of community engaged effort is with getting input from the people who we would consider stakeholders. So those are the parents who are, are cared for at the clinics, uh, who come to the clinics. Those are the providers who are providing the care, the uh, staff uh, and the administration and leadership of the clinics. So really finding out what are their um, challenges and barriers and and how would they restructure the way that they provide care uh, to make it better. Then we took all that um, information and worked with the team, um, which included parents and providers and staff um, from each of the clinical settings into really developing what they um, imagined would be the best way to move forward in terms of providing care. Uh, and you know, each clinic actually, because every clinic is different, every community is different, um, came up with something a little bit different than the others. I'm gonna talk about the uh, parent coach model of care, um, but the other one of the other clinics, which I won't get into today, is really uh, focused on uh, group world child care, which, which they use centering uh, parenting, which you may be familiar with. It's a group model for well child care. Um, but going uh, back to the other two clinics that went to the parent coach model of care, realizing that in order to provide care to the families that they had, they needed to expand uh, and really be able to ex expand that team, um, which would then expand the services that they can provide to families. We went ahead and tested that in, in those clinics, implementation um, in those clinics, uh, and then moved on to other um, clinics to do their own adaptation and implementation to kind of make it their own and figure out what they needed and continue to do those testings. So real quick, the, the center of the model, of course, is this non-clinician, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail, who is added to the team and really became a part of every well child care visit from zero to three. Person relies on a pre-visit tool, um, which has evolved to allow them to structure the visit uh, to the family's needs. 
uh, and then we use a text message service to keep that communication and education going uh, throughout between the visit times and then really in incorporating that into the physician the clinician encounter so I want to walk you through what the visit looks like um, to give you an idea of how this a team can work together to provide a zero to three well child care visit so the family uh, comes into the clinic will get weighed and measured and put into the exam room and the first person they see or talk to um, and I'll talk about the COVID um, kind of complications of it um, is the is the coach um, who will start with identifying what are the parents um, primary needs for this clinic visit today um, what are their concerns uh, and then addressing those which may be uh, you know things like maybe crying or, or um, introducing foods um, maybe there's behavioral concerns for a toddler but whatever those concerns are really addressing those initially and then helping the parent understand what are the kind of anticipatory guidance topics that would be uh, relevant for that child's age addressing some of those that um, the coach deems important or the team really deems important for that age group and others that the parent identifies. Uh, and then going on to the developmental screening, if it's a visit that requires a structured standardized developmental screen, helping the family complete that like the ASQ or the PEDS, scoring that and identifying uh, when there is a, a risk when there's not a structured screen, um, either for development or a social emotional screen, um, using milestones to help see if that child's on track. And then also providing that guidance and education for families on how to promote healthy develop development in the uh, multiple domains of development, including social emotional health. Um, then finally, focusing on social um, needs, psychosocial needs, uh, depression screening for the parent um, and then social needs at each visit from food insecurity to housing insecurity uh, intimate partner violence and such and then when there is a need that is identified particularly the social and psychosocial needs um, that coach has the ability to immediately provide those community resources and then after the visit also circle back to the parent find out if they got those needs um, address and if not, how they can either find another community resource um, or help them make a connection to that community resource. Now, everything that the coach does is is uh, put into the, the EHR in a template um, so that it kind of populates um, the encounter form. Then the provide then they'll go to the next patient and the provider comes in can see the uh, encounter form with what the coach has discussed, which. Uh, risk factors um, have been identified, what social needs rather have been identified or other needs, um, whether um, there's uh, developmental risk that needs to be addressed. They can focus in on uh, one or two things to emphasize that the parent coach maybe already did in terms of education, uh, re-emphasize that, do some, uh, find out if there's any clinical needs that the uh, family has and kind of wrap up that visit. Um, during when COVID uh, hit, particularly when we were still seeing, you know, that zero to three in, um, in, in the clinic and even some telehealth, the clinics that we worked with did use phone. So the coach often would do their, her whole thing via phone. Um, and then either the family would see the provider also sometimes via phone or via telemedicine or in the clinic. Um, so that has really expanded the way that uh, that interaction with um, the coach as a member of the team uh, can occur. The pre-visit tool is really um, expanded in, in how we utilize that. We started off with that first with the first two practices in Los Angeles using a, the Well Visit Planner, which is a, a web-based tool. Um, that was created by the Child and Adolescent Health Measurement Initiative under Christy Bethel in Oregon at the time. Is, uh, they're now at, at Hopkins. And it's based on Bright Futures and really allows families to identify kind of their anticipatory guidance needs. Um, we were able to um, do translation for Spanish so that um, uh, we could be uh, utilized uh, by our Spanish-speaking families. Um, 
and it has social needs identified as well. So really is a way to structure the visit so that families can identify the things that they wanna talk about ahead of time. And then the coach can see the, um, the needs that are identified as well. Um, in this next kind of iteration, as we moved on, and I'll talk a little bit more about the implementation and how other clinics have adapted the, the coach uh, intervention, they've moved to using the Bright Futures um, a tool, which you can find online and is a new for the fourth edition. Uh, at the time, they took that uh, third edition tool and really enhanced it to be able to address more social needs uh, and do some developmental milestones in between as they use the ASQ for developmental screening. So that as, a, as the families uh, fill out or with the coach fill out the pre-visit questionnaire, that one-on-one um, -on -one coaching with the coach occurs as they identify those needs. The text messaging, uh, portion of the intervention is really to keep that communication going uh, in between visits. It's based on the child's birth date, uh, the language of the family and the clinic that they attend so that the messages are age appropriate and give them a way to connect back with their uh, clinic if there's a need. So for example, there may be, um, there are automated messages and let's say at six months, they reach out to the families, you know, um, talking about, um, are you feeling blue? Do you need to talk to someone? Here's the number for your coach, you know, um, and you can call, you know, this number if you need uh, some support. So those are, um, you know, the messages go from uh, promoting things like book sharing, um, reminders on flu visits, uh, uh, flu shots. So really just Con keeping that connection, emphasizing um, some of the anticipatory guidance topics that were discussed during the visit. Once those initial clinics kind of created the process of how they wanted to provide the care. So then the next thing we did was, um, you know, as researchers do, uh, start a, a randomized control trial to really pilot and see what the effectiveness of this was looking like. And what we found, so we did the randomized control trial of the intervention versus usual care, um, enrolled families when they had a baby who was 12 months or younger, and then they stayed in the study for a 12 month period. Um, and essentially the main findings were that families in the intervention performed better on the receipt of well child care. Uh, they received more anticipatory guidance and health education more so psychosocial screening and are more likely to receive a structured developmental screen. They reported better patient experiences of care in terms of helpfulness of care and family centeredness. And um, we saw a 50% reduction in the number of families who had two or more um, ED visits. We also did a little qualitative work with the families and to really find out how do they experience um, when they're used to seeing having one provider who's providing their well child care services, what does it feel like for families to have a whole team? Um, and interestingly enough, families really kind of got it almost right away um, that each member of the team had a distinct um, service that they were providing. I think when people think about including a non-clinician as part of their primary care team, um, they are, you know, there's some concern, well, will the families ask the community health worker clinical questions that, you know, they're not comfortable answering. And we didn't find that at all. The families really, um, uh, re really understood the different services that each kind of team member was providing and appreciated this kind of larger team-based approach to care that was being used. Um, they weren't at the clinic for a shorter period of time, um, but felt like their time was more efficiently used throughout. Um, they were able to develop a trusting relationship with the, uh, with the coach. They um, received guidance and education, and then also felt like that coach provided a, a level of social emotional support that they didn't have um, previously. Um, with just one on one relationship with their provider and and I think we I saw that we in that story I told about Rosa and the and the parent who was experiencing um, homelessness 
and that social emotional support and that relationship that was created. They really appreciated being able to identify um, both and prepare for the visit with the pre-visit tool. Um, some parents were able to complete it in the waiting room ahead of time, and then um, some really needed that um, guidance from the coach to be able to provide it during the visit. And then uh, loved the text messaging service, um, mostly because many of the messages were so familiar from the things that they discussed in their visit. Oftentimes they felt like even though they were automated messages that like it was a coach talking to them um, or their, their clinic team talking to them directly. So um, after that initial pilot, then um, we uh, expanded and went to, you know, two large um, FQHCs, one in the Los Angeles area and one in Tacoma, Washington. And these clinics, again, had the same concern that those initial practices had, um, that they are, we're seeing the vast majority of their families, um, you know, they're like 95% plus Medicaid, um, had more uh, needs that they can account for um, or, or provide for in, in one well child care visit. And we're really concerned that families were leaving the clinic with unmet, um, particularly social needs, um, but um, also the needs in terms of uh, development and behavior for their infant and child. Uh, so we connected with these clinics and rather than them just taking the intervention and implementing it, um, we kind of went back to the drawing board and they spent about a year figuring out how do they adapt this team-based approach to care to what their community and what their parents and what their providers needed. And I think as we do uh, community-engaged research, what I love about that community-engaged um, intervention design and adaptation is that when you're able to do that, there is a sense of ownership, I think, from the um, clinic as, as my community partner in most cases, that there's an, a sense of ownership for the intervention. Um, the, there, there's a trust building that happens there, I think, um, with the, the academic research team. Um, and, and then there is a, that I think alone creates greater sustainability of, of, the, of, of the intervention. And so that's been very fun to do. So these pictures here are of um, three coaches that we initially um, uh, that the clinics actually uh, recruited and, and hired to join their well child care teams for early childhood um, in their clinical settings. And um, they generally were previously working as um, health navigators in clinical settings in primary care. So we're now in um, these 10 clinical sites of the two FQHCs uh, conducting a cluster randomized trial with 914 uh, families who are enrolled and they'll just be finishing up the trial um, in the end of June this year. Um, and uh, started off with those three parent coaches and have trained um, at least one more um, since then. That has um, really been an internal training. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, implementation uh, now. So I'm going to talk about some examples of kind of what happened in this new implementation and the adaptation. And I think I, I'm to generalize on not specifically this particular um, team-based approach to care intervention, but it's generalizable to really how clinics can adapt team-based approaches to care, um, integrate community health workers and their team and, and do that implementation and what are the challenges and kind of things to figure out in the midst of that. So starting with the, the non-clinician team member, right? The community health worker, the coach, the navigator, um, whatever the term is that we use for that individual who's joining the team. So these clinics, one of the things they re realized at first, um, and when we look at the other, other team-based approaches to care, it's always initially the level of person who was hired as that non-clinician is a little bit um, more, um, has a higher level of education and preparation in terms of not necessarily being a, not a, not a licensed professional, but for example, that first parent coach that we hired when we first did it was a, a master's level health educator. And so what the clinics identified right away is that they wanted to be able to 
absolutely find someone from the community who had that shared lived experiences with families. And that was more relevant than whether they had a master's degree or a bachelor's degree, right? And so that's really the concept of this umbrella term of community health worker, someone who is has shared lived experiences, has trust with the community, and can connect with that community that we're working with. So they really, that's how they ended up um, hiring these three individuals, two of whom uh, were working as um, in kind of health navigation around behavioral health um, previously. Uh, and then since then, we um, they hired and trained uh, one additional person, a fourth uh, coach. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about the training um, as well. The visit documentation is a really important part too, I think of bringing in a new team member having that pre-visit questionnaire integrated into the EHR was really important to the clinics and I think really transformed the way that the, the coach could work with the team so that their, the communication with the coach, um, particularly when, there's, when it's asynchronous, right? So in many cases in COVID, they had to do their visit on the phone, but to be able to have that encounter started so that when the provider sees the patient, let's say the next day or, or two days later, they have that information available and if needed, they can do a warm handoff that's verbal, but oftentimes that communication can happen within the clinic encounter. It also allowed the coach to be able to fill out the developmental uh, milestones, the social needs, the anticipatory guidance, what they talked about, and have that right in the encounter and not living someplace else. Um, most of the clinics also um, implemented a social, a specific social needs systems in terms of that communication with the uh, clinic, um, excuse me, the community resources, because what they were finding um, previously is that uh, when we make a community referral resource, if the parent doesn't actually make it to that community referral resource, you know, in the essence of referral was never made. So it helps that not to be that drop off um, and so that they can check back and see, okay, did the parent make it to um, the food bank? And if not, um, what was the barrier and how can we kind of address that for this parent and then for other parents who get that same referral later? So that's another important thing to think about. We really rely on the training, right? So Bright Futures is really important. So you can take um, a community health worker who's maybe worked in the um, even adult primary care and because they have these um, um, base, they, they have the, the ability to connect with community, connect with families, uh, but really just need that um, uh, training in terms of uh, preventive care on the health promotion themes and bright futures, the visits and the competence, and we did competency assessments. And then really to get them integrated with the team, starting with observations of visits, going to mock visits, practicing with the EHR, and then going to precepted visits and then visits with feedback. Um, that's kind of the process we went through in bringing um, the community health workers up to speed with the teams. Uh, that training around the community resources and screening is really important um, because again, if we're addressing social needs and we're making community referrals, the referrals are only as good as the places that are being referred to and whether families can make it there. A couple of other things that I think are really important for the implementation of the team-based approach to care is getting the, the coach to provider ratio correct. Um, and this is, it's dependent on the volume of um, zero to three that the clinic sees, which of course can vary. It's very different for a, pediat a, a clinic that has a pediatrician or pediatricians working versus family um, medicine providers. So there's fewer, um, uh, babies in the visit. Um, in many cases, when we're working with family medicine clinics, um, those coaches actually receive training to see older kids as well, um, and maybe do social need screening for school age kids. Maybe we'll do, um, in some cases, we're trained to do um, more uh, uh, health education around things like um, healthy eating and um, physical activity, and even one clinic trained our coach um, to be a part of uh, team visits and focus on the heads exams. Um, 
And then the scheduling, um, the templates are going to change when you include another person on your team who's doing things. So one of our pediatricians who's working essentially one on one with a coach um, because of her paraclinic setup ended up adding two additional visits in a half day for her because she was just being more efficient um, with those visits. And then another uh, clinic changed their uh, visit template from 20 to 15 minutes. They're just able to um, the visits, the time that the family spent in the clinic wasn't less because they had that time with the coach, but that's the, the visit slots were changed to allow um, for that more team-based approach to care. It's really important to think about how we integrate um, uh, team training. So in particular, uh, if we just take something like the developmental structured screen, it goes from the MA, making sure that the family has the, let's say the ASQ to the coach, ensuring that it's completely filled out and, and scored, and then the provider on really making that determination of what to do based on the um, developmental risk that's identified on the screening. So we found that having those trainings for particularly a new coach, but in collaboration with the whole team was very really helpful. The clinician role, I think when um, we are not used to working as primary care providers with a team, with another person um, on our team, how to help that provider um, kind of be able to integrate um, their work going from a one-on-one -on -one into a team. And so one of the ways that this came up for us, at one of our clinics is one of the pediatricians noticed that she had generally been doing all the social needs screening um, for all of her well visits. And then when the coach, uh, came on and was doing that, she felt like, you know, concerned that the families would think, well, maybe, um, you know, uh, the doctor doesn't care anymore because she doesn't ask me, this other person does. And so it was really important for her to be able to, when she comes into the visit and sees what the coach has identified and done resources for, to just acknowledge um, that this is occurring for the family um, and that they're um, going to um, get community resources for that help. One of our um, clinics uh, at Seattle Children's, or actually two of our clinics at Seattle Children's use this team-based approach to care where they use community health workers who are part of an early childhood organization. So this is another completely different way of thinking about who are the coaches. And they, um, they're navigators or early childhood navigators that are part of this um, external community organization that focuses on early childhood. So they're trained there and then they deploy, deploy them through a grant at these two clinical sites and essentially become part of that team. And most of their work is done via phone um, with the families prior to a well childcare visit. So there's a number of different ways to think about where the community health workers are coming from. And then lastly, the tiered versus universal, that's an important thing to figure out. And some of that has to do with the availability of that community health worker's time on whether all families will see that person um, or it will be kind of a tiered system where the provider determines um, how it is done. And I think when you have a, a generally high need population, the universal uh, makes a lot more sense. I'm gonna wrap up here so I don't take up all of our um, Q&A time, but the last part I just wanted to talk about is financial sustainability. And um, we, are slow, we are slowly getting there. I think the only way to make this a financially sustainable um, team-based care, and this goes back to that second slide that I had um, from the National Academy's report, is that payers need to pay for the work of the community health worker in teams. Some states have done this already through a state plan amendment. Uh, California should be having one come up that covers certified community health workers and health navigation and education. Um, my understanding is in the summer of 2022. And in Washington state, we're working towards that um, as we speak now. Oh, I have a great team who has been working with me at Seattle Children's in, in UW and my funders at NICHD, I'm grateful to. And I'm gonna leave us with um, just some words around how important team-based care is and the, and the benefits of it. This is Lee, this, what a phenomenal um, presentation you just provided. Um, we encourage people to add their questions to the Q&A. There are already a couple of questions here for you, Tamani, particularly about pre-visit documentation. Uh, so the first person asks, um, are strengths and protective factors identified in the family assessment? And I, I presume embedded in that is how 
Um, and then um, a separate question on what we know, what you know already from your studies about completion rates for the pre-visit tools and uh, factors that improve them and any lessons learned. Yeah, so I'll start with the second part. Um, um, the completion in that first study, we found that probably about only 50% of families um, completed the pre-visit tool on their own. And that was when we used a web-based, the external web-based tool. As we moved to the uh, paper tool with the clinics that are the 10 clinics now, um, the completion rate is much higher um, because they're doing it right um, when they come in um, on paper uh, in many cases. But there's still, I think, a good number of families that are not going to be able to complete it. And, and it just gets integrated into the time with the coach so that um, they are using it as a tool as they talk about the different um, topics. And then in terms of strength-based, um, each you know, uh, clinic team uh, has really a different, I didn't get to show, but they have a different um, um, questions that they specifically put into their pre-visit questionnaire. So it is um, kind of a, a local um, decision. Um, some of them will have items and then others kind of the coach starts with, I, um, like many people may start their own visits with, um, starting with that strengths as a discussion with a family. But I think that's, that's really important to point out. Hey, we still welcome other, uh, questions, uh, from the attendees. So here's one that just, uh, came in, um, uh, curious if you can comment on how interventions like this could be translated into the hospital setting, for example, linking community health workers with, for, with infants in the NICU prior to discharge. Mm, that's great. Um, I think uh, if that, that linkage, right, allows families to make that smoother transition and maybe not only, you know, not for NICU babies only, but for kids with complex needs and think about um, our kids that are in and out of the hospital for complex um, a medical complexity. In a sense, it's like a, um, we do have, like, we have a navigation program at Seattle Children's and you may have something similar. Um, and in general, it's the, the navigator who is helping the families kind of link all their different pieces together. So um, yes, I think I've seen multiple areas where there's in general, I feel like they're called health navigators um, that they're doing more than, they're not really doing the care coordination per se, but they're providing that family with the support to almost like have someone to, you know, they have all these instructions as they're leaving the hospital. They've got all the other stressors that just come to, you know, being a family, particularly, living uh, in poverty. And so having that connection with a person that maybe they have a um, more shared lived experiences with, um, a different uh, trust, a different type of relationship that they can go back when, when things don't kind of work out the way that they think they are. I think we all have been in the case where um, families maybe hesitate to ask their primary care provider uh, something that they think is too simple or not worth the time to call the doctor for. Um, and so that's, I think, where that community health worker can really add so much in that, you know, they might call them for something that seems small, but that in the grand scheme of things can keep them out of the hospital. Great, great, great answer, Tamani. Um, we're, we're rounding up to the top of the hour. There was another question similarly about um, the potential involvement of CHWs in specialty care clinics, um, so outpatient clinics and specialty care with a particular uh, example of parent mentor programs uh, in um, uh, endocrine and, and other clinics. Um, and then the last question, I'm just going to get to it because I want you to um, be able to send us off with some inspiration, is that given the existing body of literature um, on the positive effects of uh, community health workers and allied fields, um, but it's not yet an integrated part of routine care. What are the steps we need to engage in to move from research to clinical integration, buy-in, et cetera? Yeah, I think it's Medicaid um, funding. You know, I, I think the it's slow. As I show, there's, there's only a small handful of, of states that actually have a state plan amendment 
for that community health worker. So I think that's the first piece because like clinics like ours um, are not gonna be able to consider it even if they're dependent on grant funding over and over again to do this. And then I think the second part is that implementation is a kind of a big hurdle for clinics. You're busy, you're already seeing a ton of patients and doing the best you can. So many times as in my role as a researcher, I'm coming in, I'm, I'm able to kind of put the group together, move things forward, almost like, you know, just project management, getting it done. And so not only do we need that state plan amendment to allow Medicaid to pay for it, but then clinics are going to need additional funding for implementation. And that is also something that came out in the, in the report, the um, implementing high call. Uh, implementing high quality primary care report that you need the startup funds and implementation funds because to go from usual care to this whole new structure that also I think takes um, a fund and funding resource to be able to do that work so those are the two big things I think that if clinics had um, they can get there well, thank you to Mani uh, again for a wonderful talk. Uh, to echo Paul's comments earlier for your, your intellect, your commitment, and your leadership on all of these things, and for being our Behrman lecturer this year. Um, we really are very grateful and uh, look forward to learning from you uh, for the rest of the day and moving forward beyond that. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here, and thanks for having me. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.